Welcome to the Sound on Sound Recording and Mixing Podcast Channel. I'm Mike Senior. Whenever you mic up several instruments in the same room, you'll get spill between the mics. Some people refer to spill as bleed or leakage or crosstalk, but whatever you call it, Basically, it's the sound from one instrument getting picked up through a different instrument's microphone. Now, spill has the potential to make mix down more complicated, because any given mic signal can end up affecting the tone of several different instruments. As such, plenty of Project Studio users treat it as their sworn enemy, and seem determined to minimise it at all cost, perhaps by building productions just out of samples and overdubs or by acoustically separating live musicians during tracking, or by heavily editing and processing the recordings during the mixing stage. In practice, however, this approach can prove counterproductive, making the mixing process more difficult and time-consuming, not less. So in this podcast, I'd like to explain how Spill can actually be your friend. And I'll also share some hands-on tips for making it work to your advantage at Mixdown. The first thing Spill can do for you is make each individual sound in your mix sound fuller and richer. And the reason it can do this is because the spill signals are being picked up from different locations in the room. In other words, they're picking up different facets of that instrument's sound and therefore giving a more holistic and natural impression of what that instrument sounds like in total. Let's see if I can demonstrate what I'm talking about here. Take a listen to this snare drum close mic signal, which was recorded as part of a one-room band tracking session. Now this isn't a bad snare drum close mic recording by any means. But now have a listen to what all the other drum kit mics are picking up. Now you're getting a much more representative picture of what the drum actually sounded like in the room because you're hearing a mix of spill components taken from lots of different angles around the drum. That means that the snare drum in the mix sounds a whole lot fuller and richer if you don't try and get rid of all that spill. Let me play you that close mic signal again, and then the full drum kit mix with the close mic and all the spill components. And the snare gets even fatter when I add in the mics for the other band instruments, which also have snare drum spill on them. You might be surprised to learn that such a powerful sounding snare drum was actually played with a brush not a stick, and I still haven't used any processing or effect at all. All the enhancement I've achieved has just been by taking advantage of the spill signals that were already there, rather than trying to get rid of them all. Now clearly I've chosen that particular snare drum example because it's quite an extreme one, but in any ensemble recording session you'll find that the spill signals will usually enhance all of the instruments to some extent. For example, here's a basic balance of a four-piece jazz band recording, where there are no effects at all and the only processing is a few high-pass filters. And what I'll do while this mix is playing is solo individual instruments. First the sax, then the drums, and then the piano. And notice how the sound of each of those instruments in solo is not nearly as appealing as the sound when it's enhanced by all the spill signals within the full mix. 
Now there's a second reason why spill can make the mixing process quicker and easier, and you could already hear it to a certain extent in that last example. You see, the spill signals act a little bit like ambience reverb, and help bind the mix together, so the instruments blend and cohere into a more believable ensemble sound. This is an effect that can be quite difficult to illustrate, because most recording sessions are recorded either via a live band session, or via a process of overdubbing. But about 18 months ago, I did a tracking session where I was able to compare the two different approaches directly. Let's have a listen. First, here's a section of the band backing track where everyone was performing together in the same room. And then a section of the same piece of music, but where I tracked the drums on their own to start with, and then recorded the bass and guitar together as a separate overdub. So, first you'll hear the full ensemble recording, and then you'll hear the version where I overdubbed the bass and guitar. Now all the mics and processing are exactly the same in those two different versions, which means it's quite a subtle example, so I'll play it once more for you. But this time I'll start with the overdubbed version, and then follow that with the live ensemble version. As you'd expect, the overdubbed version makes the instruments sound a bit dislocated from each other, and undermines the sense that you're actually listening to an organic band performance. Now because Spill has this power to make your instruments sound better, and also blend better together, recordings that have Spill on them can be much, much quicker to mix. For instance, that jazz production you heard earlier was part of a two-album project that I recorded and mixed within a period of three weeks, and on average the mixes took me about three or four hours each. Spill can also actually be a problem solver in some mix situations too. I remember, for example, one of the earliest projects I reworked for the Mix Rescue column, and the snare close mic sounded like this. basically all pitched resonance and no character. Unfortunately, the snare sound in the overheads was also a bit too dull to help very much. So on the face of it, it looked as if I had a drum kit recording without a snare sound. Until that is, I listened to one of the kick drum mics that had been placed on the batter side of the drum. By taking advantage of that spill on the kick drum mic, I was able to create a much more appealing snare drum sound in the final mix. In another more recent mix rescue, I was bailed out by spill in a different way. You see, the problem was that the cymbals were coming through really thin and harsh on the overheads.
but it turned out that the spill from the cymbals on the tom mics was much smoother and richer. By combining those original overheads mics with the tom spill, I was able to create a much more usable starting point for the full kit sound. Ok, so I've made the case for bringing spill back into your life. But there are some things you need to bear in mind if you want to get the best out of it. The first thing I'd advise is don't place the instruments too far apart while recording. You know, it's a natural instinct to try and move instruments as far away from each other as possible, to try and reduce the amount of spill that the mics pick up. But what this does is make the spill sound more like washy reverb and less like multi-miking. And that's what will give rise to the messy mix sound that most people are afraid of when you talk about spill. As long as the instruments balance sensibly in the room, you'll be amazed how little spill you get even when the instruments are quite close. Take this band recording for example, which is all recorded in one small room. And now let me solo the guitar submix, followed by the drum submix, so you can hear how much spill is on each one. And you know how close the guitars are to the drums? They're about one foot either side of the kick drum, and there's no gating or editing involved either. It's just that the instruments balance together in the room sensibly on the session, so spill wasn't really much of a problem, give or take the odd duvet slung here and there. My second tip is to get those tracks that have the most spill on them into the mix as quickly as possible because it gives you the opportunity then to adapt the rest of the mix in response to the spill components. So for example, take this lead vocal that was recorded in the room with the band. Now clearly there's masses of hi-hat spill on that lead vocal track, but that needn't necessarily be a problem if you adapt the rest of the backing track sound to have very little hi-hat in it. A bit like this. Then when you mix the lead vocal in, its spill completes the drum sound, and the listener's none the wiser. And my final piece of advice is to spend quality time with your polarity switches, because otherwise comb filtering can completely wreck your ensemble sound. If you don't want to take my word for this one, have a listen to this example. It's two versions of the same mix, and the only difference between them is that the polarity settings are different from one to the other. So remember, spill can be your friend, as long as you play nice. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. And be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information including web links and details of all other episodes. You can also download a 24-bit WAV version of the show from there, if you'd like to hear the audio examples at higher resolution. And just before you go, 
let me point you towards www.soundonsound.com slash podcasts, where you can explore what's playing on our other channels. I'm Mike Senior, and this is a Cambridge MT production for Sound on Sound magazine. (laughs) 